Hello everybody, Mark Eskenazi here of ME Coral. Going to take a minute today to chat a little bit about phosphates, the importance of phosphates reduction in our tank, and how in ways to maybe reduce phosphates. First of all, let's talk about why we need to reduce phosphates. If phosphate levels are high, and most of us tend to have this issue, we tend to run in a situation where we get nuisance algae growing in our system, our corals due to the inhibition of calcification, basically lose color and turn brown, and they don't grow as fast. We can't get calcification to grow. So a lot of people say, well, I got this SPS, mine are always turning brown, I can never get color. It's obvious there's a phosphate problem in the tank, and the question becomes, are you testing your phosphates? Obviously, like all other chemicals, if you're not testing, you're not gonna know where you are, where you're going. So start with a good test kit. I recommend the Hannah Checkers. Um, the $50 or so that they cost is well worth it. I believe it's one of the most important elements we need to be testing in our tank along with calcium and alkalinity. So let's start with where do we want phosphates to be? Let's start with natural seawater has phosphates that are 0 0.005. We don't want to be at those levels, that's too low. In an SPS tank we talk about 0.02 to 0.05. In a mixed tank it could be 0.05 to 0.1. But once we start going over the 0.1 to the 0.15 or 0.20 level, we clearly are going to end up with nuisance algae and our corals are not going to color up as much as we want unless it's just softies and mushrooms and zoas which kind of like a little bit dirtier water and that's okay. But the importance is to test and know what, what you need to do. Now, how can we reduce phosphates? Well, everybody has a skimmer, everybody understands the importance of a skimmer. By reducing the nutrients or fish waste out of our system, we can basically reduce Phosphate. So you've heard people have said to you always buy a bigger skimmer than you can handle because the more waste we reduce, the less phosphate problems we have to deal with. What's the next issue? A lot of people have done algae scrubbers, chato, refugiums, all outstanding methods of natural phosphate and nutrient reduction along with nitrates uh, that work exceptional in helping your tank maintain a natural system. Do your best and try to use some of those systems. Another way is through the method of carbon dosing. A lot of people have employed carbon dosing, uh, which is vinegar. I personally use vinegar. I dose vinegar. A lot of people have do vodka, bio pellets. All of these methods are just a way to stimulate the growth of good bacteria in your tank, which will naturally eat nitrates, phosphates, and this carbon that we're adding to the tank. So it does work, but that's a whole other topic on how to do it appropriately. The most important thing I think we need to give thought to here is where did the phosphates come from? If natural seawater has none, why is my tank always full of phosphates? And we need to understand that we probably put it there. And it comes from us feeding our fish, which leads to a different topic. We must feed our fish, we must keep our fish healthy, but the system's ability to export phosphates and nitrates through skimmer and the methods we just discussed needs to match your fish load. If your fish load is too heavy or if you overfeed, you are always going to be fighting a phosphate problem. And it's okay if you want a fish only tank, but if you want SPS, phosphates and color go hand in hand. Let's talk about a couple other ways of, of reducing phosphates. Aluminum oxide has been around for a while. They're white pellets. They're sold in your fish store. Um, it's one of the oldest ways to remove phosphates. It does remove phosphates, but the problem with aluminum oxide is it leaches back aluminum into your aquarium, which is a, a bad item. We don't want to do that. So everybody has moved to using granular ferric oxide, or an iron oxide hydroxide. Uh, I happen to have a little bit of it here. It's basically a, uh, a brown little pellet. You can use it in your reactors. Better in a reactor than in a bag in a high flow area, but if you have to use that, it will work that way. The benefit of this is that it will reduce phosphate without causing harm to your aquarium or leaching back or causing any problems. The negative to this is it's expensive. For those that have high, high, high phosphates, um, you could put this in a, in a reactor at $30, $40 worth and it could be consumed by tomorrow because your phosphate levels are so high. So my recommendation is GFO is a great place if your phosphates are 0.15 and you're trying to get down to 0.05. But if your phosphates now are significantly higher and you're at the 0.3 level, I would say you may have to take some more drastic measures and first determine where's the phosphate coming from? Am I overfeeding? Has the phosphate attached itself to the calcium carbonate in our tank, that is the rocks and sand, and I have a problem there. Do I not have adequate filtration in my tank? Once you've determined all of that, one of more aggressive method being used lately is lanthium chloride. Lanthium chloride is good at reducing phosphates inexpensively, 
but it comes at a risk. And the risk is if this solution gets into your aquarium, it could settle in your aquarium and now you have lanthium phosphate in your aquarium and you didn't get it out. So when using lanthium chloride, there are very specific instructions on how to use it so that you can capture the media as it binds to phosphate and not let it get into your aquarium. More could be researched on that in a long time. But most importantly, remember, everybody's system is different. Everybody's way of achieving the end result can work and does work. So find the way that works best for you and develop a good system. Best of luck, and we'll see you next time.